Progressive brings you Flowetry with Flow. An RV rolls into a campground. Kids in the back eat turkey, jerky, excessive. Dad drives like a boss with 24-7 support from Progressive. Tomorrow it's off to see the world's largest ball of twine. Would have seen it last trip, but Dad missed the sun. Get 24-7 help when you insure your RV with Progressive. Call 1-800-PROGRESSIVE or visit Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Archangels, ghosts, and Bigfoot, oh my. It's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, all the way from sunny Tucson, Patricia Kirkman. PK, how you doing tonight? Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. We both have almost identical weather. How about that for a change? I love it. I love it. I am basking in 80-degree temperatures. I couldn't be happier. I guess not. For you, that's a miracle. <laughs> ah, not kidding. <laughs> it happened overnight. We're loving it. And so tell it. me, what's, what is going on with the numbers? We've got some crazy stuff. But you know what? Before we even go there, I should tell everybody, because we've been having a lot of questions about how to watch us as we talk with each other and our guests and this is how to do it if you want to see us you go to irnchat.com that's irnchat.com and when you get there go to the menu and click on tube t-u-b-e you'll be able to see us how about it you'll be able to see pk in tucson me in the Berkshires, and hopefully soon our guest, who is the alien Lost hunter. in space. <laughs> yeah, we've been trying to get him on the air with us and yeah. have a bit of a challenge, but we've got a great producer, Joe Champion, and he is going to work it out. So Daryl Sims is an alien hunter. Oh, my God. we got so much to talk about with him tonight. Can't wait that to get That is for running. sure. I can't but, believe his adventures. Woo! I know, 38 years or some odd mm-hmm. years of that. Wow. He's got a lot to tell us, a lot, a lot. So tell us about numbers, PK. What's happening? The world is still here, well, so yes. that's good. In spite of us, not because of sometimes. I know. Thank God. But yeah, I think one of the things that we need to look at this month is that it is a six universal month. That being said, it's all about home, family, neighbors, wanting everything to be perfect. Well, as we well know, that's not the name of the game, but that's what we'd like to have happen. So get involved with things going on in your community because this is a perfect time to do so. Look at what's available to you when it comes to alternatives, alternative medicine, alternative thought functions, alternatives making way for new things to take place. But unless asked for advice, please do yourself a favor and zip it because unasked for advice is going to blow up in the face of the one that does it. And we don't want anybody being bruised and hurt out there. We have some nice things to happen. You know, and also you have uh, shared with us this great advice (laughs) before. (laughs) Whether we like it or not. This is like an ongoing, like, for the last several months, we've been hearing this. Don't give it unless you're asked. Okay. Well, But you know what happens at different times? With the universal month, it changes every month, but this month particularly, because it's a calendar five, which means there's major changes taking place. But universally, it's all about everybody wanting perfection. And we're hearing that in the chants in the street about our government and about things going on. Everybody's uptight about what isn't perfect. 
but we have to allow it to be the best it can be, not the best we think it's supposed to be. Exactly. Work on getting rid of some of this dead wood a piece at a time. That's right. Well, hey, I'm up for that. I like getting yeah. rid of dead wood, make room for the new. That's for now, sure. we have been experiencing a bit of a mystery with you. Mm-hmm. And in your room, we have watched a very clear atmosphere turn mm-hmm. totally foggy. Right. And this has gone on for what, three weeks? Two three weeks. weeks so far. Three weeks three so weeks. far. So we're going to watch closely to see uh, if yeah, this yeah, happens yeah. again tonight. Now, well, last week when we had Matthew on talking about Bigfoot, mm-hmm. We also picked up on a couple of faces that showed up in the fog. Right. Remember that? And one of them looked like Bigfoot. And so that was on your Facebook page and Mm -hmm. mine. If anybody wants to take a look, go look at that Facebook page, Supernatural Girls on Facebook. It's pretty amazing. So I think one of the things that are strange about this is when we watched the fog coming in, the first time it happened, I looked outside and it was clear. I looked at my back of my room. The room is totally clear. It's only on the screen that it's showing it as fog. and That is so weird. So I have a shaman sitting here who's going to see what's going on, if he could pick up anything from it that way. Well, we're going to expect a full report at later on uh, after the show's over, and we'll be happy to share that with our audience because it is mm-hmm. a very strange phenomenon. And uh, in my room, there wasn't too much going on in terms of phenomenon. It was the week before that right. we had, I believe, the three little aliens sitting behind me. So now that we're talking about aliens again tonight, we'll see mm-hmm. what happens. But last week when we were talking about Bigfoot, now remember... Dr. J was talking right. about how the Bigfoot called out his name. Right. And he played that audio for us. And you could clearly hear the Bigfoot saying, Matt, Matt, Matt. Matt. Exactly. Remember, it, was it was strange. <laughs> now, for our little newscast tonight, mm-hmm. we have a story from Malaysia. And in this story, what has happened is uh, people... Heard their names being called. The residents of a village in the Baychak district on the peninsular side of the country. They reported seeing two large hairy creatures that talk and actually address them by name. The mm-hmm. creatures are six feet tall and the reports refer to them as Bigfoot. Are they Sasquatch, Yeti? What are they? I think they're Bigfoot. And certainly hearing from Dr. J last week about his name being called, I totally think that they can call somebody's name. And so these medical personnel heard this from this 50-year-old person who was there living in her mother's house, her late mother's house, when she claimed she was approached by two of the creatures that appeared to have come down from a tree in the backyard. And unfortunately, they seem to have other things on their mind other than just talking to her Mm. they wanted to be close to her and she was not interested and she wanted to get away from those things so i guess she was kind of afraid but it's very interesting based on what we heard Mm -hmm. last week i mean this is what dr j said now dr j has no fear no, he does not. Of the Bigfoot, no. But this is but, something that I, I, I kind of chuckled at a little bit because the six month is about relationships, partnerships, and Bigfoot wants a relationship well, he, in a six month. Did. Yes, <laughs> I mean, what's the big deal? Oh, Why couldn't she be their friends? You know, they weren't asking for anything more. Okay. So, I know, I know. So that was uh, quite an adventure over there in Malaysia. Very, very interesting story. Definitely that. So. Yes, so tonight, as soon as I hear from Joe, we will get, oh, and I see we may have a message right here from Joe. I'm going to, I'm going to open this up so we can see he's on, he's ready to talk, and we will have to ask him to lean in closely to his mic so we can hear him. All right, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about our illustrious guest. Now, we have been really wanting to talk to Daryl for some time, right? That's for sure. Because... 
He has had years of investigations behind him. Now, I'm going to introduce him to everybody. If you don't know who he is, then I think you've been hiding under a rock because he's known as the alien hunter, and that was given to him by a journalist, that title. He is the world's leading expert on alien abductions, and his 38-plus years of field research has focused on physical evidence and led to his groundbreaking discoveries of alien implants, alien fluorescence, and as the former military police officer and CIA operative, Daryl has a unique insight to the alien organization, which he believes functions similarly to an intelligence agency. Mm -hmm. I think he's right. So he is also a compassionate and skilled therapist who has helped hundreds of alien experiencers all over the world come to terms with what they've witnessed. Now, that's our guest for tonight. But before we bring him on, I want to share something that I came across I thought was very appropriate before we bring Daryl on to the show. And it is a quote. It is from Carlos Castaneda's book, The Active Side of Infinity, where his teacher, Don Juan Matus, says something that is, I think, very telling about what is going on in the world today. What he says to Carlos is this. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our system of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our hopes and expectations and dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetousness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predators who make us complacent, routinary, and egomaniacal. So according to Don Juan Matus, we have an unwanted visitor that has pre-programmed us to do what they want us to do. Doesn't this all sound just a bit too familiar as we bring aliens into the mix? So tonight, everybody, we are so blessed to have with us, so lucky to have with us Daryl Sims. Daryl, welcome to the show. Hello, how you doing, young ladies? I'll tell you, you guys are looking great tonight. <laughs> how come Sweet we can't see talker. you? <laughs> I, I hope you can. Not yet, but I'm, I'm sure Joe's going to help you get that video camera working so we can see. We love the hat. Bravo. There you are. There, there you go. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> All right. Great to finally talk to you, Daryl. Now, you have had a long career in the field, but you've also had your own experiences as a child. Tell us about what happened to you. Well, uh, how I came to be involved in this was uh, as a, uh, an un I, I did not prepare for this in any way, sh or shape, or form, but simply meaning that uh, at age of four, four and a half years old, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night uh, with this entity somebody was in my room that's all i knew and it was walking away from me toward the wall and it was about i thought going to bump into the wall i thought what what is what's he doing you know what doesn't make any sense and uh, at that instant it turned around and looked at me and i uh, heard it say interestingly enough without a voice uh it's awake and i knew he was referring to me <laughs> so that was it's weird. Oh, wait, I've never experienced yeah. anything like that before. So um, uh, it, now he's looking at me, and I, I'm looking at him. Of course, there's a little well outside our little house on uh, 1005 South K Street in Midland, Texas, in 1952, 53. And um, I can't figure out what in the world is going on. Uh, this guy's real skinny. He's got no clothes on. It's winter time. I'm, I'm wrapped up in my blankets him it's real cold and this guy hasn't even got any clothes on so as a kid what a kid normally notices is if you don't have any clothes on they notice hey you don't have any clothes on and i know he, <laughs> he didn't have a tt he didn't have a belly button and 
of course, I didn't have a clue what all that meant, but it, except that it's weird. Of course, after 38 years investigating, I've figured out a few things since then. One of them is if you don't have genitalia, you probably don't procreate. And if you don't have a belly button or a navel, you probably weren't born. You were hatched, cloned, manufactured, or got here some other way. That makes sense. That really does. Mm -hmm. Now, were you abducted at that time, or did they leave you alone? They actually had just brought me back. Uh, it took me uh, some time to figure out that... Um, that they just brought me back from the event. So uh, the next, uh, I was so upset by the uh, event because it, it, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't terrified or anything. I just couldn't figure out who the guy was, skinny little guy was in my room with. He was pure white and he had large black eyes, but they were perfectly round, not like the wraparound Hollywood version. These uh, eyes that he had, um, well, they were interesting because they, it doesn't make any sense when you see the aliens today that, you know, whenever people describe them or draw pictures of them. And even some photography we've got are a little different than these. So when people ask me, what's the difference between what you saw and what we're seeing today? My response is, I'm just looking at a, a Shabbat and you were looking at a Corvette. It's a different model. That's all. Wow. Now, <clears throat> You've come to understand a lot about these beings and their purpose here and the way they track people. You found out all about these implants that they put inside people. Do you think that they've got a um, positive agenda or a negative one, or is it a combination of the two? Well, I think they're running the show in regards to uh, abductions uh, uh, totally. And uh, the two primary programs are running are it's a program called Contactees, in which the idea is to basically get you to go along with the program, whatever it is they're doing, and to like it and think that you're special, unique, and whatever they're doing, it's all for you, which I've not found that to be true at all. And the other program is one of, of abductees. These are people who do not feel the same way. They have a sense that something's seriously wrong with this picture and that people should not be kidnapping me or my kids in the middle of the night. Exactly. It does seem a bit invasive, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does, and especially whenever yeah. kids uh, go through their abductions and they do things like sleep with a baseball bat, a hockey stick, mm -hmm. and, uh, and got string tied around the doors, windows, and everything so they can sense anybody coming through the room. And, uh, and my own son, in his case, uh, yes. set up a bow and arrow uh, the next night um, mm -hmm. In the uh, at the door so that uh, it could shoot anybody coming through the door to get him the next night. Oh, great. That's yeah. a little dangerous for the family. It, it is. It, <laughs> Goodness. It. But the point is that kids uh, are so uh, mortified by some of these events. Again, mm -hmm. it depends on which program that you ended up in. If you're an abductee, your view is that uh, something's wrong with this picture. I didn't want this, and it's not supposed to be happening to me. This is invasive. And it didn't. As a former police officer, I can tell you it's kidnapping. You can call it anything you want. And as one lady said to me, she says, but you don't understand at all. And I said, well, please enlighten me. And she says, the real thing is they, they bring you back, and this is the way it really is, and so on. And what I uh, relayed to her is that uh, this is, in a nutshell, uh, it's still kidnapping. And I said, and when I work kidnapping cases and do this sort of thing, I never get people, uh, the moms and dads, coming to me and saying, oh, Mr. Sims, you need to rethink your position. There are good kidnappers and bad kidnappers. And it probably was a good kidnapper that got our child. I never hear this, ever. <laughs> I bet you don't. Yeah, now you mentioned and one of the things, one of the speeches I heard you make about this, that they have a way of tracking us, if neural pathways that they follow. So once they've got you in their sights, you really aren't free they come after you they do select you and uh, we have developed some statistics since the uh, late 1980s and uh, some of the statistics are rather telling and it kind of gives people a better hint as to who they're looking for 48 45 percent of the people taken in these events are Native American Indian Irish Celtic or Gaelic really and when you look at that you're it and when I went to Turkey, as an example, they said, Mr. Sims, we loved your presentation, we loved your work, but this is one area that you're incorrect on. 
And I said, uh, no, the stats are correct. And they said, but we're all Turks, Mr. Sims. And I said, the stats are still going to be correct. So uh, a professor from Mankira, the capital of Turkey, came to the United States, did DNA testing on certain Native American tribes in the north, and took the DNA testing back and tested the Turks. And guess what? The Turks are Native American Irish, a Native American um, uh, Turk. And the, the amazing thing about that is they brought over Native American tribes and had the biggest powwow in the history of powwows in Mankira. <laughs> Because they're all for heaven's sakes. But now, why why do you think that they take Native Americans and and Irish people? Why why them? Uh, goodness. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if we look at look at it basically, and it, since I'm both Native American and Irish, I can talk about them and uh, with impunity, which others may not. <laughs> <laughs> If you're not one of them, you got to keep your mouth shut. You know, <laughs> privilege and that sort of thing. But the fact is right. that if you uh, if you trampled and traveled to Native American lands almost anywhere in the U in the U.S. a long time ago, you're looking for a quick haircut or or a battle. So uh, the uh, that's number one. Number two is when you go after, um, uh, you go to the, for instance, uh, Notre Dame, and you look on the wall there, and you, right there, Notre Dame, it says the Fighting Irish. What I'm saying basically is that the Irish and the Native Americans tend to, uh, and historically, uh, they like to fight. Busting head and taking names is what we've always done. That's just the way it is, and like it or not, that's the way it is. Even among the Cherokee, we had the the uh, the uh, <clears throat> war council and a, and a peace council, a peace chief and a war chief, and that, it's just that simple. Once the peace chief gave up his right and uh, and declared war, it was a. It, it, let me let me just stop you for a second because it what we've heard before. Maybe you've heard this as well, or you know this as well. It seems like they follow their own genetic strain. So the people that they, the lineage they've created, because this tends to be intergenerational, right? It's it does it does point to that. It certainly does. So it's I've heard before from Native American medicine people that they only come after their own. So. In their uh, creations, you're one of them, I guess. I mean, you're somebody they follow. You're somebody they uh, they come after because, in their minds, I guess you're one of them, right? Well, I don't think so. Uh, the The facts are that, if, in my viewpoint, and and it's a, this will be a, a totally different spin on a lot of people's thinking tonight. I think uh, my suggestion is that now I've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, that the alien, as we envision it, the, the I call them the seven models because that's what they really are. They're not aliens. They're they're seven models that somebody's made, hatched, cloned, or manufactured to interact with mankind to convince us that these guys are from some other planet. But when you look at the DNA, for instance, when you look at the uh, look at the Nordic alien, so to speak, he's human. You're probably not going to find a lot of humans on uh, planet Venus. Probably not. So where would you get DNA for to cr construct a human alien DNA? We well, probably from planet Earth. Where would you get DNA for a let's say a praying mantis? Probably not on Jupiter. Planet Earth is the place, and every one of these entities, including Bigfoot, which now they have decided from DNA testing is actually simian or ape-like creature and modern woman. Now, how did modern woman get in the picture? My point is that somebody is doing their DNA work and have been doing this for some time, probably not in the millions of years, but probably in the last uh, seven to 10,000 years, and they've been doing this for a while and introducing these quote-unquote alien species to us as if they, in fact, are from another planet and they, they made us, they created us. In fact, is they didn't. Somebody made, hatched, cloned, or manufactured them. Okay, but there is then what you're saying. There's a lot of genetic uh, 
experiments going on and that are creating the life forms that we see here today, whether they be human or something like Bigfoot or maybe, who knows, maybe even Dogman. We've heard about Dogman, too. So it just seems like they are running the show. They have... The lid on this, they have, I mean, the government covers it up. You were a CIA operative, so tell us about that. I mean, the government is keeping a lid on this as best they can, even in the Internet age. Well, the government has uh, has done this, and, and to be sure, to, to in case there's a member or two of your audience that don't know this, um, when we say the government, realistically, we're speaking of a cabal inside the government in, in its interagency, of course, and it involves the Office of Naval Investigations, the Central Intelligence Agency, and several other groups as well. And some of these other agencies like NSA and so on are more like database places where they get more, more of their information. DSP satellites is a good example. The point is that the government per se doesn't have a clue about anything. The government is, <laughs> it, 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 it collects taxes and, and taxes laws. That's Your all honesty is overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, that is true. Yes, yes, we know. So this is this is a whole separate gig that's going on, and uh, I would imagine there's a lot of our tax dollars being funneled into these black op projects and things like that that we'll never hear about and never see the light of day. So who's benefiting from that? Uh, us, kind of, uh, in a way, uh, I think, and I, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this is the case, I think ultimately we will benefit the American people and hopefully others in the world because uh, the intelligence boys have found things that are quite disturbing out there. And um, and, and my hope is that uh, they're using those black budget for something besides just stealing technology. Uh, the second thing is that it obviously benefits the intelligence people. That particular breakaway uh, space agency that is all their own, that nothing you're ever going to know about, nothing I'm going to sit around and know about. Exactly, exactly. So there's, they're still working hard to cover everything up, but the Internet is uh, is overwhelming with inf information. Some of it's disinformation. Some of it's people making things up. And I know you've had experiences with people sending you photographs and you know they've been Photoshopped. But then you also have had the experience of people sending you information and it's real. So the government must be having its hands full trying to control all of this information overload. I would suspect that at least half their budget is the security aspect of it. Hiding. No kidding. Wow. Hiding. Wow. Amazing. Yes. Well, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Gosh, we have a lot of questions for you, Daryl, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. Uh, uh, we've got to talk about these implants. We've got, to, again, the, tr the way they track people. Do they... Do they track people that don't have implants, or all of these people have implants that are being tracked? Number one, implants are extremely rare, and your audience needs to know that. I discovered this oh. in 1960. That's okay. how I discovered it because it was my own case when I was 12 years old. The point is that implants are extremely rare, and every abductee I talk to at every conference, they always come up and say, please test me, check me with your equipment. I know I've got at least one, and maybe sometimes some people say hundreds of implants. Just in most cases, just not true. So that's mm -hmm. the good news. The, the other good news is that the implants are not tracking devices. They never have been. If they were tracking devices, um, and uh, they track you from birth, as an example, the implant would be bigger than you were. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So the implants, uh, when they're installed, is later during the person's life, usually between the age of, of 4 to 12 years old, whenever that time happens. If there is an implantation, that's generally where it's going to occur. And those implants are not designed, the implant, and I'll give you a definition of this later, but basically implants are not transponders, they're not tracking devices at all. The alien tracks all abductees and all contactees, in my opinion, through something like a neural, uh, a, a neural uh, signature. Okay, hang on to that thought, Daryl, because we're going to have to take a very short break, but we want to come right back and, and have this conversation because people want to know about implants, what they're really for, and how people are being tracked. You're listening to Supernatural Girls Radio, everybody. Just stay tuned.
listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. You didn't forget what's coming up tonight, did you? Hi, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Never miss that interview you were looking forward to or the show on your favorite topic. Follow IRN on Twitter, I underscore R underscore N, and get reminders about the evening's live shows as well as fun and important updates throughout the week. That's I underscore R underscore N, and never miss a great show again. Do you want more out of life? CreativeStrength.us can help you turn your dreams into a reality. Do you suffer from common health issues or stress? Are you sick of living day after day in pain and anxiety? Have you tried traditional methods but see no results? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then the 15-day Scalar Energy Healing free trial is perfect for you. When you sign up for the Scalar Energy free trial, you'll get three free treatments, a pathogenic cleanse, nutrient therapy, and chakra balance for every day of the 15-day trial. Go to creativestrength.us to learn more about this free trial and sign up. There is no credit card required, only your willingness to improve your life. Anyone, anywhere in the world can register for this free trial of Scalar Energy Treatments. Healing energy is all around us, and now creativestrength.us has a way to help you harness it to improve your daily life. Only a picture of yourself is needed to be treated with scalar energy. Simply email your photo and enjoy the scalar energy treatments. You can experience the miraculous, life-changing powers of scalar energy healing from the comfort of your own home. Visit creativestrength.us. Change your life for the better, effortlessly. Go to creativestrength.us today. Hi, can you hear my voice? Imagine how many other people can hear it too. If you have advertising needs, then look no further. The Inception Radio Network currently has openings for on-air advertisements and radio show sponsorships. Given any thought to your target demographic? Inception has you covered there too. Advertising on a network gives you multiple opportunities to advertise on a wide variety of radio show broadcasts, and we have one to fit every advertising need. You know, in recent years, Internet radio has exhibited a phenomenal listener growth. An Arbitron Edison survey shows that online radio boosts at least 33 million unique visitors each week and 54 million each month. And that number amazingly continues to grow. And these listeners are a part of many businesses' core demographics. And surveys have shown that Internet radio listeners are far more likely than regular radio listeners to spend money on a whole range of activities. You know, Internet listeners vote, they dine out, eat fast food, and they grab a cup of coffee. And here's the interesting one. They buy items online at a much higher rate than all other market segments combined. Internet radio also enables businesses to connect with consumers during work hours, where increasingly more lifestyle decisions are being made. Advertise with the best. The Inception Radio Network offers competitive advertising rates to fit just about anyone's advertising budget. Stop by today at www.inceptionradionetwork.com or call us toll free at 1-888-919-2355. Get the word out. Get results with the Inception Radio Network. Are you a fan of Inception Radio Network? Do you reckon it's the best alternative talk radio station on the planet? Well, if you do, head to facebook.com forward slash Inception Radio Network and like the page. Tell your friends, spread the word, and keep listening to the best. Hello, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Remember, you can take your Inception Radio shows on the go. Just download the Inception Radio Network app for your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphones and access live shows, past shows, guest lineups, and much more. Just visit the iTunes Store or the Google Play Marketplace and download it today for free. Your property tax bill. Have you seen it lately? It's frightening. Your property taxes are going up while your home value is going down. It's time to fight back and win. 
For the real truth about the property tax system, get Attorney Pat Quintilian's book, Are You Getting Screwed on Your Property Taxes? How to Find Out and How to Fix It. Attorney Quintilian answers all your questions and gives you the facts you need to fight a property tax bill that is spiraling out of control. You'll also read about what happens to property owners who don't check their property records, only to find out too late they're taxed on square footage, fixtures, and even buildings that they don't own. Is this happening to you? Learn your rights. Buy Attorney Pat Quintilian's book today. Are you getting screwed on your property taxes? How to find out and how to fix it. Available on Amazon.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I'm here with my co-host, PK, and our amazing guest tonight, who we've really been looking forward to having on our show, Daryl Sims. Daryl, we've been talking about implants. Now, this is news to me, that implants are not tracking devices. I am shocked. What about you, PK? Are you shocked? Well, I was very startled about it. What's all right? What are the implants radioactive or anything like that? That that even if a person isn't aware of them or that they've been implanted, that others can pick it up. There are different ways that uh, we look uh, for uh, evidence. One of them is in the visible range, of course, where if you have scoop marks, cuts, lumps, bruises, bumps, and this sort of thing, we look at that. The second thing we do is use uh, ultraviolet light to uh, light up the abductee and see if, they, if they've been physically touched by the alien entity, there's two possibilities that will, there'll be evidence there. There'll be a casual contact, in other words, three large fingers or a hand will literally, uh, the imprint of that will be on them in the invisible range, but they'll, it'll light up beautifully under uh, black light. And oh, for it's, heaven's it's, sakes. It's, it'll penetrate the skin sub, subdermally on contact. You can't get it off or wash it off. And oh, what, what purpose do they serve, Daryl? What's the point of these implants? The purpose of implants uh, are multiple, in my opinion. Uh, one of them, uh, is an, as, as an example, uh, one of the things they may do, and we've seen some evidence of this from uh, doctor's reports and others who look at this with us, is that uh, some of these implants seem to be able to alter levels of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, potassium. Now, any psychopharmacologist or anybody with any basic education in, uh, in neurotransmitters will tell you that anybody that can control those in a human being literally determines whether you're sad, glad, suicidal, happy, or what. They run your show. Wow. So the implant serve as a mind control technology. It, it, it could. Uh, some of them uh, appeared uh, like a little girl uh, a mother called me one day and said, my little girl told me that she was a strange little bald-headed man with large black eyes in her room, and he did something in her nose. And I said, well, so what should I do? I said, have her sneeze in a Kleenex immediately. And she had her sneeze repeatedly, and she said, oh, my God, there's four little tiny gold spheres that are about the size of a pinhead. And uh, long story short, I eventually got the four spheres and had them looked at by a university at uh, York University in Toronto, and what we found there uh, under the care of a tenured metallurgist is that the objects were 51% uh, silver and 49% gold. And it looked like a little tiny planet. They're, they're about the size of a pinhead. It's possible that a medication, I don't like the word medication because that's not what they're doing here. Some type of uh, medicative material might have been placed on that and the, the little craters would allow more of it to get uh, to last longer to, in effect, uh, medicate the individual if that's what it, what was really happening. But we found eight of those on that little girl, two or four on two different occasions. Oh my oh, gosh! What yeah, what's that's... a draw for? Why do they choose certain people? Is there a specific draw to certain ones? Is there something about their makeup that makes them the target? 
Well, there's I do I classify uh, objects in two ways. One is uh, implants and things that are embedded. Uh, there are objects that are embedded in people, and then things that are implanted. Some things that are embedded are not for any uh, any discernible uh, real purpose. Um, it, sometimes it's a red herring. Uh, in other cases, uh, they, where the implants themselves show up, uh, there seems to be something very specific going on. In the first two surgeries we did in 1995, uh, literally what happened was uh, the objects, four objects out of two people, uh, a man and woman who did not know each other, the objects turned out to have the most remarkable biology that uh, that a Nobel laureate is still harping about. And the second thing was the implants themselves were looked at by Los Alamos and New Mexico Tech, and they determined that whatever the objects were, they were extraterrestrial in origin. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. Well, Just that's amazing. the smoking gun, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. when you, whenever you can produce some proof, which you've done, about something that's not of this world, there it is. I mean, well, it, it seems to be. And, uh, uh, of course, it, what's proof to one person is nothing to another. Um, everybody's got their own idea of what that is or isn't. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, my search is about physical evidence and, and other evidence, too. It's not just stuff that we can just necessarily see because we see the effects on people. It, even when we do handwriting analysis on these people, uh, handwriting shows the behaviors and things that, that are consistent with your life. And One second, Daryl, before you go on, I just wanted to mention you've got somebody. Yeah, you have a mischievous something in your room. There you go. Your screen, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you look much better now. Okay. There now we can see <laughs> you're your, all there. It was, it was gradually <laughs> moving up to just your hat. So we didn't okay. want to lose you. And I thought, one of those aliens is just playing what a trick. What are they doing in here? So uh, handwriting it tells us a lot about the individual's life and about their habits and so on. Uh, if they have a propensity to lie, a propensity to exaggerate, uh, this sort of thing, it shows up in your handwriting. So we look at this. But what we found was something rather amazing. In some of these people, we found behaviors in the people that, that don't show up in the handwriting. What does that mean? Well, what that means to a handwriting analyst is somebody else at somebody else's behavior that's installed in you. Wow, that's and that's pretty dynamite. That is dynamite, and uh, uh, we're supposed <laughs> to have free will on this planet, but clearly there's something that's superseding that. Well, I think that free will uh, exists. I, I have a I have a, a different view of a worldview, probably than some people. I think that there is destiny, I think there's predestiny, and I think there is free will. Uh, free will can be tampered with. Uh, for instance, if you give people, uh, if you give somebody that has a propensity to do drugs, as an example, eight different kinds of drugs, and then free will, uh, you're probably going to get a drug addict out of the deal. I mean, that's it's just that you're giving, you're providing them choices that's, uh, Really, that's outside their free will. They're, they're, it's, it's creating a problem for the individual. But is there a choice? I mean, when these things come into your room at night and you're four years old, what is your choice? Where is your choice? You're four years old. This thing comes into your room, takes you. You kind of come to consciousness as it's bringing you back, and you notice he's got no clothes on. Where's the free will? Where are you in that saying, yeah, go ahead, take me on board your ship? Very it's not good. happening. Here, let me finish the rest of that little story, and this will probably um, answer part of that, at least. Okay. Uh, when the entity looked at me and, real, and made the statement, it's awake, and I realized he's talking about me, uh, I was not afraid. I was not paralyzed. I was sitting up in bed looking at it. Then all of a sudden, its eyes moved in some particular way, and I don't know what that was. All I know is that at that instant, I became paralyzed, and a, and a fear came over me that I have never experienced in my entire life. I've never experienced anything like it. So what that simply means, and since now after all these years of investigations, is two things. Number one, he transferred his fear to me. We as human beings try to think of the alien as having lifestyles like our own. They have no such lifestyle. They live in fear. They live in enormous fear, some less than others, depending on your station in the caste system, so to speak. 
And uh, when he came toward me, I became so frightened. I pushed real hard. Uh, and I had a little tiny bed, a little hot like bed. And I pushed it apart from the wall, so it was kind of a B at that point. And I fell with my head hit the floor, and I was wrapped up in my little covers, and he couldn't get to me at that way. So it was the kid's worst nightmare. He lifted up the covers of my bed on the floor, from the floor and stuck that large bulbous head and large black eyes right next to my face. Oh, and, God. oh, it, it was it's just beyond horrible. And he cha- he didn't shape shift. I could figure this out at age four. I can't believe people can, still can't figure this out. He did not shape shift. He tried to change my perception of him into that of a clown, and that was supposed to be my screen memory, so I wouldn't remember who he was. And I kept shaking my little head, no, 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 there's your free will. And I wanted to remember him for what he was, not for what he wanted me to think he was as a bad dream when he left. Well, good for you. That's quite a feat of willpower for a four-year-old that you were able to achieve that. That's amazing. So it's a real testament to who you are as a person, that you were strong enough to do that back then. So, But here's another question. I heard a rumor that you actually figured out a way to thwart an abduction. Is that true? Can you teach people or tell people this is what you need to do if you don't want to be abducted? Yes. All right. Oh, good. <laughs> I thought you like that. <laughs> <laughs> we have to hear this. We don't have, <laughs> what do you do? Because you know, from what those, you're describing, oh, it doesn't. It's not pleasant for most you, people. There are some things you can do. Yes. And okay, people what? write me on my website, alienhunter.org. Click on Alien Hunter. I'll be glad to send you the information, and you're welcome to test all of it if you want to. It's free. That's great. That's amazing. Okay, alienhunter.org, everybody. That is the website. And you also have your book for sale there, yes? That's about the only thing we've got for sale. Everything we do is philanthropic. Uh, We did 25 surgeries thus far. The last one I did was in India on an implant surgery there, and all of those are free. We we don't uh, charge for whatever we do, we don't charge for, I do hypnotic anesthesia, I don't charge for that. I don't do any type of, uh, any of this at all for any cost. It's it's a philanthropic effort. I know what these people have gone through. That's tremendous. I mean, that's a real tremendous effort on your part. So one of the things I've heard you mention before is that if you want to disengage from an abduction, you take them off balance. And I think in one talk I heard you say you can put your arm around them and act friendly. And that just takes them totally off guard. Well, in that particular case, the lady uh, uh, came one night uh, to her hypnosis session and she said, they said, if I give you any more information, they're going to come after my children. I said, young lady, do you think they're going to do it anyway? And she said, yes. And I said, uh-huh. that's kind of a moot threat, isn't it? And she right. started crying. She said, you've got to help me protect my children. I said, I'm getting better evidence and better information from you than I am all my abductees total, just you. So she kept crying. I said, okay. I, I, I'll. So I gave her a specialized system that I developed just for her, and she literally took control of the alien that night when he came in. And, and he did this happened on two occasions. Uh, what I wanted from her uh, she said, what do you want? And I said, I want Freddy Krueger's hat out of the dream. I want you to tear his eye cover off and bring it back to me. Wow. And she did tear it half off the first time, got it completely off the second time. But unfortunately, there were more entities in the room. There were five of them in the room the second time. And what, in effect, happened is they finally, each one got on a finger of themselves and pried her fingers apart and got the, the eye cover back. Because I knew the eye cover was removable, because I knew that from four years old, because I remembered what he did with his eye uh, at that time. So the eye cover, is that like a, was that like a fabric eye cover or like a helmet? What was it that... No, I think of it as, a, a, think of it as a, like a, a cosmic sunglasses for the alien. Um, okay. And uh, it, it may be of a plastic type material. Sometimes uh, people report it kind of has a sheen to it. So, uh, but it's an eye cover, and sometimes you'll see the aliens with them on, and sometimes with them off. Hmm. It allows well, they look like the to see them the off. Red, ultraviolet, X-ray, invisible light, all at the same time. Oh, okay. That's well, I've got a couple questions. 
when they yeah. say that, they actually did. They're true because he's actually scanning inside you. Oh, my oh, God. Wow. <laughs> well, I've got I've got a couple of questions for you from our, our chat room people. Space Traveler is asking, uh, Daryl, do you know whether the Earth has any natural resources that an alien species is trying to mine? Well, the, my answer to that is twofold. Uh, the current people, the beings we're calling the aliens, which I call the seven models, no. Because they're made, hatched, cloned, manufactured by someone else for their purposes, not for the aliens' purposes. The alien is just, they're just doing their job. They're just, they're just made for this purpose. If another, if there, if there really were aliens, and I don't think we've seen any yet, if there really were aliens from other worlds that came here, would they want our resources? Well, I would certainly think so. Uh, that would make sense. And any, and, and uh, Dr. Stephen Hawkins says, any advanced civilization over any other civilization has always taken over the resources, the people, the everything about them, and either assimilates that population or destroys it. What would be the difference if others came here? Oh, because they're higher and bigger and better than we are. Yeah, really? Isn't that what the Spaniards there by the Indians thought about the Spaniards too? Right. Exactly. Yes. Good well, answer. Yeah. And I have another question for you from Neutron is asking, for the sake of keeping her memory and abduction research alive, Daryl, can you tell us about your late friend, Carla Turner, and her findings? I can. Uh, Candy was uh, a buddy of mine. Uh, uh, I loved her very much. Uh, everyone that knew Candy loved her. She was the uh, shortest woman I ever saw. She was <laughs> four foot nine or something. I mean, she's this little tiny thing. And of course, I'm, I'm six foot. And she, we're, we're standing there laughing at each other. And you're getting Aww. a chance to talk to her. She's a wonderful lady, uh, a fighter beyond understanding. Um, uh, I told Candy uh, before she died, uh, I said, everybody's going to say the CIA, the government, whoever gave you cancer and they killed you or the aliens did it or whatever. I said, in your opinion, what it, what's the deal? I said, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to make stuff up and I'm not going to listen to this stuff. I said, tell me your view. That's all that matters to me. And Candy told me that she did not think that the CIA or anybody like that had given her cancer. She said, people die of cancer, and that's that's what's happening to me. And I said, I understand. And I said, I do know of cases where cancer has been apparently transmitted to abductees and specific, more specifically, contactees. And, oh. oh, this is hor horrific. If contactees had a clue, see, contactees, that they, they had this, rose-colored glasses they, they live by, and I, and I love them, I, I, I do, I, I, I admire them. But they need to pay attention to the stats because you can't just use your rose-colored glasses and say everything's fine out there when you're finding people that have been mutilated like cattle. That you, can't, you, you can't ignore evidence, yeah. you can't do that. You just can't do it. No, can't, exactly. And he was a fighter. But do you, so you're saying that cancer may be spreading as a result of the relationship that contactees have with the ETs? I'm saying that uh, many abductees have touched the aliens, as I have, and uh, didn't get cancer or anything else from them. Sometimes they get sick as a result, uh, because I think some <laughs> uh, that's due to their eating habits and also due to the, uh, the dirty needles that they may be using on people. Ah. So you often will end up after <laughs> flu-like symptoms. They're worse than oh. a junkie. <laughs> My God, alien, can't even use clean gonna... needles. What the heck's wrong with these aliens? That's terrible. Alien, it's on purpose. Wow, mm. oh, that's awful. Well, when you talk about, um, again, taking the extraterrestrials or whoever they are, the aliens, by surprise, and doing something they don't expect, and that's how you can, one of the ways, you can get control of the situation. Now, I've heard this before, and it's used quite effectively with the men in black. Now, have you heard that before, that people can kind of confuse the minds of the men in black by answering the questions in a strange way that doesn't make any sense, and so they get confused? I have a, a funny, fascinating story from uh, a conference I went to uh, up in Sioux Falls. Um, the, 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 um, let's see here. Um, it, yes, in Sioux Falls. And uh, while I was there, uh, a lady I spoke to said, um, 
she would, she was a she was a psych she's a psychologist on top of that, and she said I was doing a part time job as a, a, a working you know just filling out forms and stuff for apartments, and she said I, I walked around the corner and there's this tall guy in solid black standing there with a long black coat and it's the strangest looking thing I've ever seen in my life, and I didn't know what to think about it, and she said uh, I said well what'd you do and she said I I had my little clipboard in hand, I shoved it into his chest and said, fill these papers out. <laughs> he, he was so stunned. He filled the papers out. And I said, he what? She said, he filled the papers out. I said, oh my God, I'm a handwriting analyst. Give me the, give me a copy of the, the, the printing. And, and I, the lady has gone since then. I've, I've not, she's not written back. I don't know where she's at. If she's listening, please send me the handwriting sample. <laughs> oh, like, my God. God. Oh. That is a great Incredible. story. I love that story. Good Lord. Can you imagine that man in black, whatever he was, just is standing there filling <laughs> out the paperwork? I love it. I love it. So, right. so again, it's, it's best not to follow any uh, orders from them. Time for you to give them some orders. Big difference. Well, there are two kinds of bibs. First is the kind that she ran into, which is the uh, alien version. They, they are just a transgenic, uh, a human form, a transgenic made for the purpose of, again, cleaning up messes that the alien makes and can't figure out how to fix. So they'll send him to take care of the problem. That's what they do. The second th kind is, uh, and I've had encounters with this as well, the second kind is the government MIB, and this guy, these people are uh, awful. Uh, they know a lot about you, a lot more than, and they're getting, in my opinion, a lot of their information from NSA, no question about it. And they follow these certain abductees, and uh, and they've done this with some of my own abductees. It's fairly rare compared to the volume of abductees, but these people, uh, one of them made a super, super stupid mistake with the last one that he dealt with of one of my abductees. And I asked my abductee, I said, what What did he do that was so stupid? He said, he gave me his business card. <laughs> and I have followed up. So on men that. in black have business cards. <laughs> oh my God. I would like to have one of and those. And it doesn't say MIB on it. <laughs> no? What does it say? Uh, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Daryl. I just wanted to just mention, PK, your room's getting foggy now. I know. I saw that. I just looked at David. I just said, uh, it's yeah. fog. Daryl, this has I... been happening. I don't know if you've been aware of what we've been going through the last few weeks. Three weeks in a row, all of a sudden, PK's room gets Fourth super week. foggy. So I don't know if you remember how she looked at the beginning, but if you look at her now, you see there's a level of fog in her room. Yep. So we're we're gonna get to the bottom of that eventually, but it's a it's a really incredible like phenomenon. So. Yes, it's very, totally very clear. Interesting. Outside is totally clear. Yeah. Clear. So those of you who are yeah. listening, but you want to see this, go to irnchat.com, click on the menu tab, and then click on tube, and you'll be able to see what we're talking about. And more importantly, you'll be able to see Daryl's hat that we really love. Yeah, I love his so, hat. <laughs> I know. Take, a, take an air sample of that room. Yeah. Oh, yes. Take some air samples. Get take some jars. Let let them sit open and, in, and seal them so they can't uh, so nothing can escape. And it, because if that ever disappears, you'll still have the air sample there. Good idea, Daryl. Oh, okay. See, he's a true investigator. He knows exactly what to do. He, he knows what to I do. I just sit here and take pictures. That's all I do. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I'm sitting in a totally clear room, but everything around me on the screen it's is foggy. Like, it's, very it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's this is wow. the fourth week that it's done this. Yeah, here we go again, everybody. Well, look, uh, we're going to take a very short commercial break. We're going to watch PK get foggier and foggier, <laughs> and then we're going to come back <laughs> and we're going to talk some more. Yes, with Daryl Sims, Alien Hunter. So you are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio, everybody.
listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. Inception Radio Network listeners, this is Amanda. Just a reminder that Inception Radio Network is on Twitter. Follow us at I underscore R underscore N and keep up to date about who's on tonight, what interviews they'll be doing, who's guest spotting, what topics they'll be covering. Tweet to us, tweet about us, retweet topics to your friends, and most importantly, never miss a great show again. That's I underscore R underscore N. computer is your internet connection down don't worry use your trusty cell phone or landline and call into our listen line at 401-283-6700 to listen to the inception radio network 24 7 again that call-in number is 401-283-6700 for the inception radio network i am mj do you want more out of life CreativeStrength.us can help you turn your dreams into a reality. Do you suffer from common health issues or stress? Are you sick of living day after day in pain and anxiety? Have you tried traditional methods but see no results? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then the 15-day Scalar Energy Healing free trial is perfect for you. When you sign up for the Scalar Energy free trial, you'll get three free treatments a pathogenic cleanse, nutrient therapy, and chakra balance for every day of the 15-day trial. Go to creativestrength.us to learn more about this free trial and sign up. There is no credit card required, only your willingness to improve your life. Anyone, anywhere in the world can register for this free trial of scalar energy treatments. Healing energy is all around us. And now creativestrength.us has a way to help you harness it to improve your daily life. Only a picture of yourself is needed to be treated with scalar energy. Simply email your photo and enjoy the scalar energy treatments. You can experience the miraculous, life-changing powers of scalar energy healing from the comfort of your own home. Visit creativestrength.us. Change your life for the better, effortlessly. Go to creativestrength.us today. Hello, Inception Radio Network. Would you like your favorite show to be played again live on air? Well, now the choice is in your hands. With IRN's live request portal, an easy way to request your favorite show with a simple click. IRN's live request portal now gives you exclusive access to all the shows. How easy is it? Simply type a show name or a guest name, click request, even write a dedication message, and that's it. Try it now. Simply visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com, click on the live request tab under the show menu. Now playing your favorite show is just a mouse click away. Are you a fan of Inception Radio Network? Do you reckon it's the best alternative talk radio station on the planet? Well, if you do, head to facebook.com forward slash Inception Radio Network and like the page. Tell your friends, spread the word, and keep listening to the best. Are you ready for a new experience of freedom and powerful connection? Would you like a positive, effortless change in your life? Then come to CosmicFusion.com, where we offer the most advanced energy clearing and expansion techniques in the world with a quantum vortex energy to activate your divine blueprint and life's purpose. When your soul leads the way with cosmic fusion and quantum vortex energy, you can break clear of past difficulties and blocks with the power of the source. With cosmic fusion, the source energy does the work for you. It's easy and effortless. Listen to our free meditation right from our Cosmic Fusion website, The Cosmic Code Meditation. Sign up for one of our interactive webinars today. Come to Cosmic Fusion, www.kosmicfusion.com to experience an effortless awakening and transformation. Are you ready for an upgrade? Are you ready for a new experience of living in the fifth dimensional magic and powerful connection? Then visit CosmicFusion.com today. CosmicFusion.com
Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, here with my co-host, PK, and our amazing guest tonight, who we're thoroughly enjoying, Daryl Sims. Definitely Sins. that. He is Alien a, Hunter. My goodness. Him. Good Lord. I know. He's going to try to help us stay, stay safe amongst this uh, very treacherous path here with these aliens I, I don't know you know i used to feel kind of good about them not so much anymore so <laughs> we want to hear Daryl. please tell us about some of these abductions some of the strangest stories you have heard from your people what has been going on okay i can give you a, i'll give you a thumbnail here of a couple of our cases this one um occurred here in texas and uh, the individual spoke to me um the long and short of it is he was a fisherman. He was a boy, uh, and he was with his dad fishing, and uh, they were kind of like the swamp swamp people, uh, that sort of, it's that mentality that they fish all their life. That's what they did. And a, they were fishing one day, and a bright light came, showed up underneath. It lit up the murky brown water they're in, and it just steamed all the water around their boat. And they're, like, freaking out completely. He said, I was, he said, I was kind of excited. My dad was just terrified and uh, said then, after a few minutes, he said, whatever it was that was underneath the boat took off and left a wake as big as a ship. And it went to the horizon, and uh, we never saw it come out of the water. And he said, the very first thing my dad did at that time was to put the, uh, uh, the boat in gear and it got it started and uh, we ran he said he ran the boat all the way up onto the beach he said which my dad would have beaten me senseless if i'd have done anything like that, <laughs> <laughs> the boat like that. Never. and then uh he oh, said that's wow. how scared he's my dad's not afraid of anything and everybody loved him he said the bottom line is that um that uh he went he ran as we drove as fast as he could in the car and uh and uh Went and got my uncle. He said they drove all the way back as fast as they could. And he said, and he brought his boat back. He said, and then we, we uh, I said, what was what was the problem? He said, our boat, our, our aluminum boat was magnetized. <gasps> aluminum does magnetize. He said, my dad tried to lift the gas, our uh, steel gas can out of there. He said, and as strong as he was, he said, it took all his strength to get the gas can off the boat. He said, they drug the boat out into the middle of the, of this area of water, body of water, and they shot holes in it and sank our boat. Oh my gosh! Seven six. And I said, why is that? He said, "Because my dad didn't want anybody to ever find the the boat, the evidence, or anything about it, and that none of that could have happened." He said, and told me, "You didn't see this. None of it happened. Forget it. It never happened. Period." So I talked to the guy, and um, years later, he told me, and this is this is going to blow your audience away. I was talking, got him on the phone, and I was talking to him, and I said, so how did things go for you in life after that? And he said, well, uh, uh, he said, I was babysitting one day. My little daughter was in there, a couple of years old, was sitting in the bathtub with about four inches of water, safe, of course. And he said, the phone rang. I ran in, got the phone real quick, talked a couple of minutes, came back in, and my daughter's dead. <gasps> oh, my God. No. Oh. He said, I'm an ENT guy you know I'm, i can you know i know all about how to resuscitate and everything he said my daughter uh was dead he cried and he cried and cried and i said no w wait a minute i said i'm an investigator i'm going to put my cop hat on here it's going to sound really insensitive just answer the questions what did your daughter look like he said she was dead and i said talk to me he said her eyes were still wide open and in stark terror i said okay i said What's the next thing you noticed? He said she was stiff as a board. I said, <clears throat> rigor mortis doesn't set in that fast. He said, exactly. what are you saying? I said, listen carefully to me. He kept crying. He said, my wife left me over this. I said, listen carefully to me. What? When's the last, have you ever seen the look, that look on your child's face and anyone else's face in your entire life, and it's so the very first time. And I took him back. It's called a transderivational search, and uh, in NLP. And uh, and over the phone, he broke out and started freaking completely out. He said, "Oh my God, my dad in the boat when the light was underneath us." 
but they don't realize that abdu abductions already happened. They just brought them back and put them back in the boat. They don't even have a clue. And I said, whatever got your dad that day got your daughter in the bathroom while you were on the phone. When it heard you coming back, it dropped her in the water. She was already scared stiff, literally. And it dropped her face down in the water and she drowned because of that event. It's not your fault. And he cried. That is a tragedy beyond belief. Oh, God. Not the only case like that. That is a tragedy. Right. My God. Awful, awful, awful. Just horrible. Now, I, I have a question for you, Daryl, about abductions, because it, it seemed to us that there were a lot of abductions and reports of abductions that were taking place through the 80s. And then they seemed to kind of uh, peter out a little bit. So it didn't seem like we were getting the reports or it wasn't happening. I don't know. So have they lessened the abductions or not? I hear this all the time from people. And I hear it from people that, number one, uh, are not in the field. They're reading books or watching TV or something. Uh, I'm in the field, and uh, business, is, business is brisk. They're still doing what they're doing. They haven't slowed down at all. In fact, if anything, they have sped up. And Really? Uh, oh, oh yeah. my God. It's uh, business is, I've got uh, four, uh, well, I get, a, I get a bunch of calls all the time, but I've got four really good cases uh, three of them are contact. Uh, three of them are abductees, and one of them is, an, is a contactee, and um, that's just this week. Oh my goodness! Wow. So it definitely isn't slowing down any. And I'm not the only investigator out there. I'm just I I'm just the only one that that deals pr primarily in physical evidence. Uh, by that doesn't mean that I don't believe your case or anything. It's just that I have so many cases, 1,950 plus worldwide that I can't take on any more cases of, I saw a bright light. I don't care about bright lights in the sky somewhere. What I care about is, is evidence and what you can do to interact with them to cause them to cease, desist, or do something else or acquire some type of evidence for us. Well, that makes sense. It really does. So you're not wasting your time and you're really trying to make some headway on this issue. Now, uh, I read something about you had you were actually in close proximity as an adult to some aliens, and you said you almost had them. They were a couple of feet away from you. That is correct. <laughs> it, um, I have an abductee that is an engineer, and he gets abducted every year on vacation. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Oh, what a vacation. The <laughs> Snowmass Wilderness <laughs> near Gunnison. And so oh, I thought, God. why waste the opportunity. So I took seven investigators with me. We went up there for a week, and uh, people always see these neat pictures of me in the, like I am now or whatever, and they say, I want to be one of those alien hunters too. <laughs> uh, I show a picture of me in this article, and I'll send it to anyone that wants it. It's the article about that whole story, but basically they, wait, they didn't do anything, and uh, on the last night they showed up. But it was so high up in the, in the in the bush where we were at up in the mountains that uh, it, 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 it was very difficult for me to breathe well, so I didn't get sleep very much. So uh, I was literally worn out. The point is that, um, <laughs> that uh, uh, on that last night they came and one of them came outside my, uh, outside my tent and I could see, I could see him. Uh, through the tent, the shadow of him from the light of, that was on my tent. And I uh, had a large cut toe knife. I was going to run through the tent and impale him. And people said, oh, my God, why would you do that? And I said, because he's just a toaster. They got a million more just like him, and they, don't, they mean nothing to the, to the program, nothing. They don't care. If they mess up they'll, and they do it a couple of times, they'll just get rid of them. They'll just open the airlock and let them out. You know, they don't <laughs> care. They don't care. They they, they, I get that feeling. Nothing mm -hmm. to, like, to us. It, it's a totally different scenario. But the, the bottom line is several other in, uh, people had seen or had contact in some way or another with that, those entities that night. And uh, it was absolutely an amazing uh, story. And I'll send it to anyone who wants it. It's free. 
to anyone who wants to click on AlienHunter.org and, and say, send me the story of the contact that you had with the alien. What I did, though, rather than, in, uh, than to try to take him that night physically, I got thinking I could probably do this anytime. I want to see if I can still have contact with them mentally. Is that a skill that I still have? That was really important to me as an investigator because I hadn't been abducted since I was uh, 17 years old. And so what I did was to uh, see if I could do that, and it worked. And to my shock and amazement, I also, not as a, an abductee this time, but as a, as a trained observer and a trained investigator, as I got into his headspace, I noticed something really remarkable. Nothing was in there. The only thing that he thinks or does is what he's told, instructed, or trained, or put in him. He doesn't have any independent thought. So he's part of a, a hive or a collective. That would be a, a mm -hmm. nice thing to think about. My goodness. So who's in charge? <laughs> the $64,000 question. Yeah. <laughs> and do you know, Daryl? Well, I could tell you. But. <laughs> The question that really I uh, think should be framed if you're going to ask that is who constructed, made, hatched, or cloned the alien? Oh, okay. That's the real question. Who's on first? Who right. did that? And there are two primary views. One is the Sitchin view, which uh, I was reading some stuff on Sitchin a long time ago, and I thought, this guy either can't translate Hebrew properly or Sumerian, or he's not a Hebrew or Hamer Sumerian scholar, or he's lying, one of the two. Which is it? So I can't, I can't figure that out. So I went to a friend of mine who is a Hebrew, Ugartic, and ancient Sumerian scholar, and told him my difficulties with some of the things I was reading from Sitchin. I said, why can't this guy translate this stuff properly? And he says, that's a very good question. I said, why don't I get you and Art Bell, or someone like that, on a big radio program or a TV program, and have a proctor between you two, as someone who you both respect, and just let you two get after it, and we'll find out who's right. And he said, that would be great. And uh, Sitchin's crew would have nothing to do with it. Oh, and, no. Oh, boy, that, that sent all kinds of red flags up to me. But the bottom line is Sitchin's basic view was the ones who came down from the heaven uh, came to earth. Well, that's not quite the accurate rendering. It, basically, there was war, and they got kicked out. You got a number 12 boot in the face, basically, and you came to the, whoever kicked you out, you took personal interest in their property, which happened to be this particular planet and a program going on here. And as a result, um, so you've got Sitchin's view or you've got a biblical view. But one of those two views makes a lot of sense to me, uh, and they're similar in, in some respects. That whoever they were, they came down here, and even the Sitchin view shows that the best thing that they did for mankind is make slaves out of everybody. Oh, that was the best thing. Wow. I wonder what the worst mm. thing is. Yeah. Maybe I don't want to know. Really? Yeah. That's, yeah, so it's a difficult question. But here's another one for you. These things that you described as just like toasters, do they have a soul? No. No soul? No. When uh, I, I did a, an incredible, this would take a, a whole show for us to do, I did, a, I did an experiment. I'm the alien hunter. I don't have an alien hunter name just because it's a name. It, it, it's, it's actually, uh, it's not only a noun, it's a verb, and it's an adjective. It describes what I do. And basically what, what I did was to uh, uh, program an abduct, a contactee, not an abductee, and they agreed to this whole thing. And in their next abduction, they got taken, and something remarkable happened. Uh, they blurted out this information that I programmed in them that I thought was dangerous to the alien phenomena, if it was real. I found it in another abductee. And uh, long story short is uh, eight of our people were taken in two states and several cities by independent craft to a massive craft of which we think we have a video of currently. And the craft was approximately 50 miles thick, 600 miles across, located near the moon at the time. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. We do have a video that we think is it. The point is that on that craft, two highly intelligent beings, um, not representative of the quote-unquote alien, but the but the makers, the guys in charge. I call them mid-level management. <laughs> they said that they've got the seven the seven so-called 
races of aliens. Everybody calls them the races. All mm -hmm. standing there scared to death in front of the guy sitting in the big chair. They're really scared. And in the other room is the lady I programmed. They got my senior investigator in one room, and, and they got her in the other room asking the same uh, th primary three questions. Number one is, why did he do this? And they, and my senior investigator said, I knew it was you. He said, it had it, it was because it, your image came up when he said it. He said, and you didn't tell me that. Why didn't you tell me? I said, you're an abductee. Why would I tell you anything? You're going to tell them everything. He said, of course, I did. And I said, like I said, why would I tell you anything? That's what you do. So they asked three questions. And these are the big ones. Okay. And why did he do it? And he said, I don't have a clue. And the, the guy in the chair got really upset when he said that because he, when he asked a question, he demands an answer. And it scared everybody there, including the big Nordic. The Nordic was uh, over six foot six. Oh. And Dale stands six two. And he put his big, beautiful blue eyes right next to Dale's head, eye to eye, forehead to forehead. And he looked back to the big guy sitting in the chair and he says, he doesn't know. And that cooled the guy off when he realized he actually didn't know. The second question he asked, he said, he, he, Dale said he produced a holographic image of a brain in front of me. This is really important for your audience. In that holographic brain, he looked at Dale and he says, point to the human soul. Where is it located? They didn't know. That is important. In the, mm -hmm. other, the same questions were being asked of the woman, but with one difference. They produced a human brain in front of her on a screen. And pointed, he, pointed, he told her to point to the human spirit. Where is it located? They have no idea where the human soul or spirit is located. And that's one of the things they're interested in. The bottom line, whether you think the aliens are here to save the planet, fix the ozone, or whatever you think they're here for, they've come a long, long, long way to get what you have, and they can't do it without separating it from you and it causing death. So they don't get anything. So that's the problem. That's a big problem. They're not interested in your DNA. They've had your DNA for a thousand years. Doesn't mean a they, thing. They want our right. soul. Well, they want to do something with it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting thing you bring up because I know, PK, mm -hmm. you and I have been talking about the work that George Lugo and I have done looking right. for the missing people that have been identified by David Paulides. And what we found was exactly that, that a number of these people were being taken for their souls, and then the bodies are dumped. They're just empty containers when they're done with them. So it's pretty... To me, that is much more frightening than taking a tissue sample, you know? The, the or, or People are wanting to make this a quote-unquote physical phenomena. It does have physics. It does have all kinds of things in the infrared, ultraviolet, and interdimensional ranges. I am all aboard that. But the extraterrestrial hypothesis involved with the so-called seven, the usual suspects, as I call them, that some people refer to as the aliens. In my opinion, you're you're looking at something far bigger and that this is more of a spiritual issue than just a quote unquote nuts and bolts issue. Agreed. I think we both agree with you on that. There is there's a lot more to this. Absolutely. Now I have another question from the chat room for you and he says, Daryl, have they perfected and changed their abduction techniques? which makes us believe there are less today. Hmm. I, I, I think that's true. Uh, a long time ago, in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, they, you weren't supposed to remember anything. The very In my event, when I told you about that in 1952, the very first thing, he, he was alarmed because he said, it's awake. I'm not supposed to remember anything. And even when he had to fix the problem, he tried to give me the screen memory of a bad dream of a clown. And many abductees have clown phobias and they don't know why they have them. And that's where you get them. And that's, these are just pro Oh, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. But they, there are, they are very effective. But one of the things, they, something's changing, and I will tell you this, in the mass abduction I told you about before, the big program where I, I actually got them to respond to us, Yes. One of the things that was fascinating is my senior investigator saw a giant map in a special room, and he asked the Nordic, what is that? And he said, that's our interaction with mankind. And he saw this big, he said, well, what's that little 
little so small section about an inch long there and said that's all the time we have left oh wow what do you mean and of course being an engineer he said that's the last hundred years now we don't know if it's in the first 10 the first 50 or the, or at the end of it we don't know but the bottom line is that of course being an engineer is what he did while the, the nordic was doing his thing he computed all the how much it would take of all that little inch there. He said it was approximately six thousand years on that map that they had been actually involved with us, according to the map that they had in that massive craft, six hundred miles across, fifty miles thick. God, that is just bigger than enormous. I don't even know what to say about something that huge. But again, there's so much going on in this phenomenon, and and you have it so such a vast amount of experience what's the best advice you could give somebody if they feel that they're abductees and they need some help should they give you a call should they write to you on your website the best way to get in touch with me is to write me go to alienhunter.org and click on alien hunter it will send me a message immediately uh if i don't answer you for whatever reason don't think that i'm ignoring you i'm not uh, i answer all my email so just do it again and uh uh, but I, I normally get to all my mail, and I, sometimes I'm on a trip or speaking or whatever, and I can't get all of it then. But I carry my computer with me, and I do answer abductees' uh, questions, concerns, emails, uh, because I care I care about these folks. I know what they're going through, and uh, I will not leave them alone without any kind of help. I won't do it. Well, God bless you. I mean, it's wonderful because you've got the best of all worlds in what you're offering all of us tonight. I mean, you are an investigator yourself. You you had this experience a number of times, so you know personally what this feels like. You also went through this with your son, and you are an investigator that knows all aspects of these cases. So I, in my opinion, they couldn't have anybody better than you to help them. So, yeah, everybody, alienhunter.org, and right. feel free to, to go ahead and, and contact Daryl by his book. What's the name of your book again? Give that out, please. The book is on the site as well. It's called Alien Hunter, Evidence and Light. I look at the alien in the visible light, invisible light, the infrared, and the ultraviolet, and x-ray, just like he sees us. You can see him as well. Ah, oh, that's amazing. My amazing. wonder read a quote for the end of the show what a great show i mean daryl you're amazing and thank you for Definitely. all your great work oh it's wonderful here's a quote again we started with carlos castaneda's book the active side of infinity and a quote from his teacher don juan matus and here's a, another one to take us out you have little time left and none of it for crap a fine state I would say that the best of us always comes out when we are against the wall, when we feel the sword dangling overhead. Personally, I wouldn't have it any other way. So that's my quote. <laughs> it just ties it all together. Yes. So wake up, everybody. Let's pay attention to what's going on. If you need help, reach out to Daryl. He'll he'll help you. He'll be able to get you uh, to the right place to make peace with all of this, and that's very important. So, Daryl, thank you again for your time tonight. It's been a wonderful evening spent with you, well spent with you. Definitely. You that. Pay and, and Patricia, whatever they're paying you, it's not enough. I'll complain to management. <laughs> we love you, Daryl. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, everybody, we'll be back next week. We are talking about forbidden archaeology. We're going to hear how we devolve. How exciting. Until then, <laughs> we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>